All right. Yeah. All right. Well, welcome to our final day of the Holy Land presentations, and uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Gracious God, I want to thank you for our time together this morning. Um, thank you for um, uh, these pictures and for uh, this uh, experience, and we just pray that as we uh, learn more about the Holy Land, that we might uh, grow in our relationship with you, that uh, as we read our scriptures, that they might be opened up to us, uh, viewing them in a new light. And so for all of this, let me just pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so day seven was a, was a really long one, um, because after a full day of looking at stuff, then we got on a flight at Tel Aviv at, Tel Aviv at 11, 10 p.m., and flew all night, and uh, <laughs> I don't remember what time we arrived back home, but it was a long, and of course, then we took like a northern route to take a flight. Hours. It was like a 14-hour flight just to get to the United States. It was long, and uh, so anyway, so we uh, we made it, and we, so on the seventh day, we visited Emmaus, or one of the sites that they think is Emmaus. Uh, we visited the Isra Israeli Museum and the Holocaust Museum, and then we visited the Wailing Wall and the Teaching Steps, or the Southern Steps, as they're sometimes called as well. Um, so the first uh, site we went to was, this is one of the sites that they think was Emmaus. Um, it, uh, so this is Abu Ghosh. <clears throat> Abu Ghosh is an Arab-Israeli local uh, council in Israel. Um, it's located about 6.2 miles west of Jerusalem. Um, it is also the site that the Crusaders identified as Emmaus. Uh, Emmaus is a town mentioned, of course, in the Gospel of Luke, in the New Testament, and in Luke 24, 13 through 34. And you all, I think, know this story where two men were walking to Emmaus um, discussing the resurrection, right? <laughs> and Jesus shows up in their midst. They don't recognize him. Um, and once they get to Emmaus, Jesus eats dinner with them, breaks bread, and that's when their eyes are open and they see him. So um, our guide told us that there are three different sites that commemorate the site of Emmaus, but the actual location of the ancient town is unknown. I think part of that, if I'm remembering from some of my reading, is because there's 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 different descriptions of it in different sources, and even in the Bible, it's like listed as with several different names, and so the exact location is really not 100 percent sure. So Abu Ghosh uh, was founded at least 6,000 years BC. Um, it was built around a spring that flows abundantly through the entire year and on, the, on an axis that was to become the path of pilgrims going from the coast to Jerusalem. Starting in biblical times, the place had a, had a name, Kiryat Yerim. Its history is marked by the presence of the Ark of the Covenant during the time of King David. So this was the, one of the locations where the Ark of the Covenant was held. Um, before he brought it to Jerusalem. Uh, this church, this is a church here, this is the Crusader Church at the historical entrance to the village. Um, is a, it's now at the center of a Benedictine monastery. It's one of the best preserved Crusader remains in the country. Uh, the Hospitallers has built this late Romanesque early Gothic church in 1140. Uh, AD, <clears throat> um, and it was partially destroyed in 1187. It was acquired by the French government in 1899 and placed under the guardianship of the French Benedictine Fathers. Since 1956, it has been run by the Lazarus Fathers, and today a double community of nuns and brothers continue to worship in the church and offer hospitality, reflecting the ancient story of the couple on the Jerusalem Emmaus Road. 
Excavations carried out in 1944 confirmed that the Crusaders identified this site as the biblical Emmaus. The church is now known as both uh, the Church of the Resurrection and Emmaus of the Crusaders. And so we have one of our devotions here. Um, this was the actually this was the gal that did the devotion, and she she was the what mother-in-law of uh, Nancy Misty's daughter or something like that. I think she was part of our our group. I don't remember her name. Uh, you remember her name? Don, Don's shop. Nancy, Don's ringing. Oh, right. <laughs> I don't remember that. Anyway, of course, the lights were hard to see this, but that's a picture. <laughs> um, I don't know what. Jesus. <laughs> oh, oh, I think it's Jesus, uh, maybe coming down out of heaven, and I don't know. Anyway. It was a long time. Uh, this is inside the church. They have really great acoustics. It was beautiful. I think they probably were built for the acoustics. They, they are. Yeah, a lot of them are. Uh, so, in spite of the damage caused by earthquakes, bad weather, or human ignorance, the mural paintings covered, covering the walls and pillars on the church's eastern side constitute an exceptional example of frescoes. They are of Byzantine workmanship and of great quality, and they were done by Greek Orthodox iconographers. Specialists give their date as the third quarter of the 12th century, under the Emperor Manuel Comnenos. They are from the dynamic phase of the Comnenian style. And they've done some, what they can, I guess, to preserve and refurbish them. I was thinking everything was so made out of stone. The, the wood, you know, it isn't like I mean, the acoustics are, of course, better with all the stone. It's like in a cave, so there's like caves almost above the ground. And they were so well built. If I'm remembering right, when I did the research there, there's three three walls, and they have scenes depicting um, Jesus' uh, resurrection, his descent into hell, and then and then his second time return. It's kind of hard to see this one. This is the wider city of Emmaus, I think. So maybe anyway, I don't know. <laughs> here's the here's the Jerusalem uh, Museum, Israeli Israeli Museum. We weren't allowed to take pictures inside, so I don't have any pictures of inside, but we didn't spend a lot of time inside. But what we did do is this is the site where they had a scaled model of what Israel looked like during the time of Jesus, or second temple period, second temple period. And it was just huge. And so you can see, here's the, here's the temple mount and the walls around Jerusalem. It's massive. So, um, so here, this is the western wall. Um, this here is where the teaching steps are, and we'll we'll visit this area later. Um, but right now. Uh, this right here is where the <clears throat> al Aska Mosque is at. And here, of course, is the temple. But on this spot right now is the Dome of the Rock. And so the Wailing Wall is right here. And then uh, there's actually a 
So over the years, between the Crusaders and the Ottomans and, the, and various Muslim groups, they, they built and added stuff onto this. And so you'll see when, when we get to it that, that, this, uh, that this entrance here is actually part of it. You can only see like just this part of the arch is all. And the rest of it is all covered over with an additional wall. So yeah, here's a better better view of it. So here's where the <clears throat> here's where the Al Aska Mosque is, and then the Dome of the Rock sits here. Also underneath here is the foundation stone, <clears throat> which is believed to be the stone where I <clears throat> Isaac was um, sacrificed or where he was bound and tempted to be sacrificed before God stopped him, uh, stopped Abraham, and then. Um, it's also believed to be the place where God created created everything, the foundation stone. And then the Alaska Mosque is right here. But this is what it would have looked like during the time of King Herod. And during the time of Jesus. So after we visited there, we went to the Holocaust Museum, and uh, it occupies over 4,200 square meters, mainly underground, both uh, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. It presents the story of the Shoah, or the Holocaust, from a unique Jewish perspective, emphasizing the experience of the individual victims through original artifacts, survivor testimonies, and personal possessions. It's 180 meters long. Linear structure is <clears throat> in the form of a spike cuts through the mountain with its uppermost edge, a skylight protruding. Anyway, it, <laughs> it was neat because you went in and you, the way they had designed, you had to follow the path. And so it, it took you through, you know, how did, how did they get to where they were at, where they were killing all these Jews, right? So it looked at all the propaganda that started small, little things, right, that they would start, and the rhetoric that was used. And before you know it, you know, as, as time went on, it just got worse and worse and worse. And before you knew it, people were like, well, this is just the way it is now. And so it's actually kind of scary because we see a lot of those same things happening now with some of the misinformation that is being spread around about the virus about the, the virus and the masks and all that stuff going on. It started small and like the um, the stuff with the with the election and misinformation that was spread around with the election. Um, it started small in little places and I just got amplified and people started talking about it more and before you knew it, you had this uh, Holocaust. At the end of the museum's, or at the end of the museum historical narrative is the Hall of Names. And I, we couldn't take pictures of that either. Um, but it was a repository for the pages of testimony of millions of Holocaust victims, uh, a memorial to those who perished. And from the Hall of Names, visitors will continue on to the epilogue and from there to the balcony opening to the panoramic view of Jerusalem. And so at the Hall of Names, they had <clears throat> basically it was an archive of testimonies of people who went to, who survived the Holocaust. And they had everybody's name that was in the Holocaust. They had, and so it was really a, a site where you could go and do research if you were <clears throat> trying to find family members or trying to find out what happened to family members. And, um, and they have video recordings of people giving their testimony, what happened, and written testimony. It was really quite the sight. And then outside, they have these memorials. And I wish I had taken better pictures of the actual signs that said what each one was, but I didn't. Well, I can tell you what they all mean. I, I looked on the website for the museum, and I couldn't find anything. I think 
Yeah, I think this year was dedicated to the children of the Holocaust survivors, all the children who died. I think that's what that says. <coughs> and so a lot of this was paid for um, by reclaimed assets of those who died. Um, and they were, it was all put into a fund and helped to pay for this so that the victims will never be forgotten. All right, so then we went to the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall as it, as it, as it is known in the West. Uh, the Western Wall is an ancient limestone wall in the old city of Jerusalem. It is a relatively small segment of a far longer ancient retaining wall known also in its entirety as the Western Wall. The wall was originally erected as part of the expansion of the Second Jewish Temple, uh, began by Herod the Great, um, which resulted in the encasement of a natural steep hill known to Jews and Christians as the Temple Mount. And so the, the, the Temple Mount, which you saw in the, those previous pictures, was all, uh, those are retaining walls, essentially, that go away and around, that cover the natural hill that Mount Zion, that the original temple was on. Um, and so all of that retaining wall was actually added by King Herod, Herod the Great. And part of the reason he, like I've said before, was known as the Great is because of the huge building projects that he undertook. And so we looked at that last week, right? Looking at the Temple of Masada, he did the one in, in Caesarea. The temple was one of his biggest projects. And uh, some of the stones that we'll look at were just huge. Um, and so when they added that, all those retaining walls, so here's the, the just a small section of the Western Wall. Uh, but it goes clear that way. Um, when they added all that, then they had a, a paved uh, top part, which expanded where the worshipers could be at. Uh, the process was finalized by Herod, who enclosed the mount with an almost rectangular set of retaining walls made to support the temple platform and using extensive substructures and earth fills to give the natural hill a geometrically regular shape. On top of this box-like structure, Herod built a vast paved platform that surrounded the temple. Of the four retaining walls, the western one is considered closest to the former Holy of Holies, which makes it the most sacred site recognized by Judaism outside the previous Temple Mount platform. Just over half the wall's total height, including its 17 courses located below street level, dates from the end of the second temple period and is commonly believed to have been built by Herod starting in 19 BC. Although recent excavations indicate that the work was not finished by the time Herod died in 4 BC. And so, um, so we see there's actually seven, so each one of these is one, two, three, four. So below here, the level of the Ground, there's 17 more courses. So it just shows how tall this was. And over 2,000 years, how much has been built on top, right? Um, although recent excavations into, oh, I said that. The very large stone blocks of the lower courses are Herodian. So these really large stones here are Herodian by Herod. Um, uh, the courses of medium-sized stones above them were added during the Umayyad period, so Muslim here, right here. Um, while the small stones of the uppermost courses are of more recent date, especially from the Ottoman period, so the really small stones up here. In a broader sense, Western Wall can refer to the entire 1,601 feet of retaining wall. So that's how long it was, 1,600 feet long uh, on the Western and Eastern side. 
The classic portion now faces a large plaza in the Jewish quarter, which is what we're looking at, uh, near the southwestern corner of the Temple Mount, while the rest of the wall is concealed behind structures in the Muslim quarter, with the small exception of an eight meter or 26 foot section, the so called Little Western Wall. And we'll see that. This is not a picture, of course, that I took, but I wanted to show you an aerial view of what it looks like today. And so, um, if you remember from the model that we looked at earlier, these were the teaching steps. This was, I said, was one of the Western <laughs> entrances to, and you, you can only see just a little piece right here, and we'll take closer pictures of that. Um, and over here is the Western Wall. So this is where the temple used to sit, somewhere right in here. And here's the Alaska Mosque that I was telling you about. And so there were covered porticos right into here, according to that model. You can just see how big it and massive it is. So here's the Western Wall, and you can see that the rest of it is all covered by these houses, and so you really can't see it. But you can see the Eastern Wall pretty well. And uh, we're going to look right here. This is the other small portion of the Western Wall that we'll be able to see. So this was the women's side. But, uh, so they have it split. So here's the wall that separates. The women's side and the men's side are, are, are different sizes. The women's side is a lot smaller. Let me go back here. This is the men's side. Hmm. I know, right? <laughs> You're sitting in a room full of women. I know. I'm not, I'm not saying I agree with it. Same as the women, right? but it, it, yeah. it also shows culturally, right? Oh yeah. And so, if you can see right down here, <laughs> step on it, um, you see the guys down here with the hats, right? And they're very they're Orthodox Jews, um, very traditional. They've got the, the curly, you know, hair that comes down and, and then beards. But they're, and the Orthodox Jews control much of the politics and much of what goes on in Israel. They've got a lot of political clout, from what I understand, according to our uh, tour guide. So, but you can see how big these stones are, right? I mean, look at that. <clears throat> so yeah, there's so that's the women's side. We so, can talk about putting prayers on the paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you can, so we can go down here, um, and you had to put on. They had a they had a, a circular table that had uh, that had disposable. Uh, yeah, yarmulkes, I think is what they're called, that you yep. put on your head. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you had to put one on before you go down there. There's big signs that say, you know, put it on. And uh, so I walked down. Did you did you go down? Did you go on the women's side or the men's side? Well, I don't remember. remember. <laughs> I must have gone on the women's side. I thought um, it was just the group. So. And not everybody did go down there. Yeah. I think we were all, let's see. I we were all she, hanging back here. Yeah, I think I think Shirley and I. I mean, yeah, and so this thing actually is a bigger, better picture. So here's that sign, women on this side, men on this side. You have much bigger space. But so yeah, you could write prayers on it, then you fold it up, and then you would stick it in the cracks and crevices. So I didn't get a real, I, I didn't get a close picture. I didn't want to, you know, be like a tourist in there. Tourist, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the cracks were just full of, of prayers. And I was told that. Because of course, you know, they can only hold so many that at certain parts of the year they would take all of them out and then burn them. Uh, burn them as a sacrifice to God or something. I don't know. But you know, they were reverently, they didn't just throw them in the trash. So. That was really powerful to me to just think of being in that kind of a crowd of people from all over the world praying. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty powerful. So, um, but you, know, you guys put your hand up on there. 
I I didn't stay down there too long because I was pretty far. Yeah. Do that to somebody else. Anything else you want to add to that, Karen? Anything else you want to add? Okay. Uh, so this is down um, on the other side of the wall um, on the corner. So here's the here's the western wall. Here's the south wall. Um, and then on the so here's that other construction I was telling you about around the other side of that is where the teaching steps are. This here is so that was one of the things we talked about. You know, is how do they move these huge blocks of stone weighing tons? Well, here's one of the ways they think they did it by covering it in this these wood deals and then rolling it. I have other pictures of it here. Anything else? And then using the scaffolding to lift the stones. I didn't try and roll that either. <laughs> <laughs> I have a picture of the bishop uh, pretending to try to roll it. <laughs> <laughs> So, I don't know, I tried to get a decent view of how big these stones were so you could actually see. Um, I mean, just look, I mean, they're almost as tall as some of us standing there. Um, at the Western Wall Plaza, the total height of the wall from its foundation is estimated at 105 feet. So from down underground all the way to the top, 100 feet, 105 feet. Um, with the above wall consists of 45 storm coast stone courses, 28 of them above ground and 17 underground. The first seven above ground layers are from the Herodian period. Um, and it was uh, built by enormous Meleke limestone blocks. Possibly quarried at either Zedekiah's cave, situated under the Muslim quarter of the old, old city, or at Ramat Shlomo, 2.5 miles northwest of the old city. Most of them weigh between two and eight short tons each, but others weighed even more, with one extraordinary stone located slightly north of Wilson's Arch, which is here's Wilson's Arch right here. Um, Let's see, uh, measuring 44.5 feet long, 11 feet high, approximately 5.9 to 8.2 feet deep and weighing between 250 and 300 tons. Wow. So one thing that our tour guide stressed to us was that these stones were rival the Great Pyramids. I mean, they, they were big. A similar size to the one they used to build the Great Pyramids. You know, with it being limestone, I'm I'm surprised there's not been more wear on it mm -hmm. from water and mm -hmm. yeah. very dry there. Yeah. Yeah. But it was I mean, it's just uh, incredible. This is the southern end of the Western Wall, Robinson's Arch, along with a row of vaults, once supporting stairs ascending from the street to the Temple Mount. And you can just see all the rubble. You know. And the cracked pave, pavement. And these, I, I believe, uh, are some of the stone crypts. All right, so on the southern side, 
This is where the southern steps are at the southern edge of the western wall, just around the southeast corner where Robinson's Arch is located. Three times a year, as prescribed by Moses, faithful pilgrims like Jesus's family, um, as described in like Luke 2 41, would ascend these stairs to enter the temple, um, the place, after first washing off the dust of their travels in one of the nearby ritual baths, a mikvah. Over 50 of these baths have been excavated so far. During a festival, this area was a hub of activity. So there would have been just thousands of people in this area. This spot was the main entrance for the common man to enter the temple. So the poor, our tour guide called it the poor, poor person's gate or the poor man's gate. Uh, he would then go through the two sets of Hoba gates, named for the prophet. Prophetess in 2 Kings 22:14 and 2 Chronicles 34:22, both still visible on the wall at the top of the steps today, though sealed with the stone entrance uh, with stone since the Arab Crusader times. You can still see arches today. Um, so here, here they are. Here are the arches right here. And the other two will be over there to the left. You'll see those in there. Can you see them? Uh, in the second temple period, the eastern triple gate was the entrance on your right as you ascended, and the western double gate was the exit on your left. So the double gate is going to be over here, and the triple gate is over here. Um, only part of the western gate can be seen today due to the per perpendicular wall built into it later on. These gates led to magnificent tunnels that went under and then up into the Temple Mount. And Jeff, one of our members, he kind of got I don't know, it's low blood sugar or something. Do you remember? Yeah. You kind of got really faint right in here. Yeah, it was, I thought, wow, this is a hard place if she it, it was a bit, it was a bit kind of stressful because, and we were worried for him because we had a long day ahead of us and we had to fly back <laughs> that night. Sometimes it just felt overwhelming because it, it just there was so much walking mm -hmm. and so many steps and so much rough area. I mean, it wasn't just walking down a little nice path. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it was a nice path, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Structure wise. So, I mean, look at this stone here. Mm -hmm. The size of that thing. And I mean, he, it's as tall as he is almost. But here is that other gate. And I'll get a better shot here. There it is. So this was sealed off since the Crusades. <laughs> so, so this is the thing: is that out of all the places we visited in the Holy Land, um, what they always said, if this isn't the place, how far, right? So they think Jesus walked in these places, but they weren't 100% sure. Because they, they think it was the place, but they weren't 100%. This, they know to be a place that Jesus walked. And so that's the significance of this picture, that I got to stand on one of the stones that Jesus would have walked on to enter the temple. Or actually, in this case, I guess, exit the temple. Right? The Western was the exit. So this, you could look through a like, like a little hole, and it would line up uh, a, a vision of what it would have looked like <laughs> in the time of Jesus. And so you can see that, and it kind of displayed it on the actual wall. I didn't do a good job taking the picture, but you get the idea. So here are the entrances and exits and people walking in and out. And so it was on... The reason this is called the teaching steps is because oftentimes rabbis would sit on the steps and teach. Um, and it is believed that this was the location, if you remember in, I think it was Luke's gospel where 
they came to the temple when Jesus was around 12 to 13, and, and they ended up thinking that he was with some other members of the party. They left him there. <laughs> and they came back, and they found him teaching and sitting on the steps. Um, but this is where it was at, in here somewhere. So, so then we flew home, and... Um, on our way home, we happened to, I happened to look outside my window in the plane as we were coming over to the United States and headed to Lincoln. And uh, I saw this optical phenomenon. You see it here? Right here? It's called, a, I didn't know what it was called, but it's a reflection of the sun. It's called a glory. And um, also called an anti-corona or pilot's bow. <clears throat> um, like a rainbow, a glory is centered on the anti-solar point, which coincides with your head's shadow. So it's right behind you pointing down, right? Um, or the larger shadow of an airplane. I've seen some pictures where it actually has the, the shadow of the airplane in, in the halo. Um, you might see that when the sun is high in the sky and you're on the ground, the anti-solar point always lies below your horizon. That's why in order to see a glory, the clouds or fog causing it have to be located below the observer in a straight line with the sun and the observer's eye. And thus, glories are commonly observed from very tall buildings or from airplanes. Before the days of air travel, people spoke of glories that they had seen while mountain climbing. So I just thought it was a really cool end to the trip as we were coming in to see the a glory, right? A, that is neat. a halo yeah. of God, you know, saying mm -hmm. it was a good trip. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just happen to see it? Yeah, I was looking out the window and as we were coming And close. then you looked it up when you got home. Yeah. Uh -huh. I didn't know that's what it was called, but I thought it was really cool. I thought, yeah, man, that is really neat. Isn't that cool? I figured it had to have been a reflection of, of the sun or something. Or a UFO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was pretty neat. So, yeah, that's that's the actual one that I saw. So, and that's it. That was day seven. A little bit shorter day. We did a lot of travel. Sharing that with us. Yeah. I'm glad I got to see the last one. Thanks for coming. <laughs> yeah, they're online. Thanks for coming. I know. In your, in your spare time.